my name is Josh Friedman. I'm the director of the Cabot Prize, as I know some of you. Uh, the, uh, we have a, uh, I usually shouldn't uh, advertise ahead of time that something's going to be fantastic, but this is going to be fantastic because uh, quite a, it was not intended when we selected the winners for this year's Cabot Prize. We just select the best people we can get, but it turned out that uh, all of the winners, in one way or another, uh, are touched professionally by this engine of violence and corruption that is growing in Mexico. And uh, I'll explain that briefly, and then hopefully that will uh, unfold in our discussion. Uh, we'll have some discussion up here, and then we'll have some questions. You'll be able to pose questions afterwards. Uh, the, uh, let me give you a little background on what's happening in Mexico for those who aren't familiar. There's a massive assault that's been going on for the last several years on the civil society of Mexico. If it were happening in a country halfway around the world, you'd be reading a lot more about it. But uh, as a reflection of sort of the uh, decline of the um, American press, uh, you don't read very much about it, not enough. It's, I didn't realize until I went with the Committee to Protect Journalists uh, several years ago to Mexico City, and we met with uh, President Calderon and others, how uh, devastating it was. And I didn't realize until about a month and a half ago when I went to the border how really devastating it is. Journalists there uh, are pro are confronting the worst conditions for journalists in the world, in the world. It's, it's pretty incredible. In the last uh, six years, 40,000 people have been killed in this country of Mexico. Uh, the gang, the criminal gangs control large areas of the country, especially around the border. There's a lot of corruption of all the authorities locally. Uh, the criminals are involved with uh, drugs, smuggling guns, smuggling people. They're spreading to Central America. They control at least 40% of Guatemala, for instance. Uh, the, uh, they smuggle the people across the border into the United States. And despite what the Tea Party and others say, the number of people coming across the border has actually dropped precipitously in the last few years. However, the uh, border control is stronger, so they're thrown into the hands of these uh, drug gangs uh, who try to press them into serving as workers or in the drug business or prostitutes. About 11,000 people, migrants, were kidnapped in six months last year. 11,000 in six months. Uh, many of them wind up dead. First, they're sexually assaulted or tortured. So that is the uh, condition in which all of the people up here are working. It's, it it, it uh, is worse than working in Baghdad or uh, Kabul or whatever. Uh, and th this will unfold in our discussion. What we're going to do is I'll introduce each person and they'll make a few uh, remarks for a few minutes. And then I'll ask a few questions and then uh, open it to you. In our, we met this morning and uh, something interesting developed, which was that uh, actually we can describe the movement. There are two big stories here. One is the drug story, and the other story is this Grapes of Wrath style migrant flow that's coming here, who have been demonized on this side of the border, but in fact are, for the most part, people who just need a job or want to rejoin their families. So uh, we can start in Central America. One of our winners is from uh, Salvador, and then we'll come through Mexico, and then we'll wind up at the border in Arizona in what we describe. Then we'll go into more questions. So first I'm going to uh, introduce Jean-Michel Le Prince. He's a Canadian, and we're going to show a small film, I hope, I see absolutely no response by anybody. If this, is it, are you going to show the film? Okay, so we're going to show a little four and a half minute film 
of some of the stuff that he's been covering. He covers Latin America generally. I'll introduce him a little more, and then well, let me give you more background now, and then after the film, he can speak for a few minutes about the general picture of what it's like to work there, covering things. Uh, Jean-Michel works for Société Radio Canada, CBC, and uh, he was uh, under the uh, Bush, the elder, he covered Washington. Uh, he was the Washington DC correspondent for them. Uh, 94 to 98, he opened uh, CBC's uh, Mexico City Bureau. He broadcasts in French, by the way, not in English. Uh, and since 2005 to the present, he's been the Latin American and Caribbean correspondent uh, based in Canada, but traveling down there very frequently. So Jean-Michel has an overview of not just Mexico, but and Central America, but the whole picture. So let's see this short film, and then uh, he will give you his remarks. Il y a toujours du monde entre l'arbre et la fontaine, autour des chandelles, à n'importe quel moment de la journée. C'est là que la grenade a explosé. Belém entend la première explosion, et comme tout le monde, elle ne pense même pas qu'il puisse s'agir d'autre chose qu'un pétard ou un feu d'artifice. Mais sous le balcon de l'autre côté de la rue, c'est la panique. Bilan total, 8 morts, plus de 100 blessés. Un mot terrible vient d'entrer pour la première fois dans le vocabulaire quotidien des Mexicains. Narcoterrorisme. La guerre de la drogue n'est plus seulement entre clans, elle tue maintenant à dessein des innocents. C'est une vraie guerre. Il y a plus de morts au Mexique que dans l'Irak, euh, de, de, de forces... Euh, américaine en Irak. Les sommets dans cette partie centrale de la cordillère des Andes dépassent les 6000 mètres. Les sommets les plus élevés marquent la limite entre l'Argentine et le Chili. Un projet unique à la frontière entre deux pays, l'Argentine et le Chili. Il n'existe pas de mine partagée entre deux pays ailleurs dans le monde. C'est dans cette vallée en Argentine que sera acheminé le minerai, qu'il sera traité et transformé en or, argent et cuivre. 80% du gisement se trouve à Pasqua, de l'autre côté, au Chili. Tout au bout de la vallée du Huasco, ces montagnes cachent ce qui deviendra vers 2013 une des mines d'or les plus riches du monde, une des plus inaccessibles aussi, Pasqua Lama. Un grand défi technologique et financier pour la compagnie torontoise Barrick Gold. Mais la Canadienne rencontre de l'opposition au Chili. Je crois que les Canadiens ne méritent pas qu'on les appelle les Yankees du futur. Avec le prix de l'or qui dépasse largement les 1000 dollars l'once, tout devient possible, même le gigantisme de Pasqualama. Jairo ne veut pas en rester là. Cinq mois plus tard, il décide de contacter directement la Cour suprême de Colombie. Cette fois-ci, on le prend au sérieux. Cinq jours plus tard, le sénateur Alvaro Garcia Romero est arrêté en novembre 2006. Il est accusé de plusieurs meurtres. Même chose pour son adjoint Eric Morris. De son côté, le gouverneur Salvador Arana Soud est en fuite. Il est recherché par les polices de 134 pays. Les bateaux de croisière européens sont revenus à la Havane après une longue absence. Tout est bon pour relever l'économie en difficulté, même si le gouvernement estimait que les croisières ne rapportaient pas beaucoup. L'État doit aussi réduire ses dépenses. José fait partie des 500 000 Cubains qui perdront leur emploi d'ici le mois d'avril. Il y en aura un million de plus à moyen terme. 
178 métiers, autrefois souvent pratiqués au marché noir, ont été autorisés. Les paladars, ces restaurants privés, s'ouvrent partout du jour au lendemain. Réparateurs ou constructeurs de vélos taxi, vendeurs de DVD, de souliers, de vêtements confectionnés maison, jusqu'aux remplisseurs de briquets jetables, il n'y a pas de saut métier. Mais attention, tous ces gens-là paieront des impôts. Les cambios que se están proponiendo sont très petits et insuffisants. Ce n'est pas une nouvelle révolution, dit-il. Nous perfectionnons notre révolution. Ce qu'on voit à Cuba ne devrait être que le début de changements économiques majeurs. En ce moment, les Cubains sont consultés dans la rue, sur les lieux de travail, et les résultats, on devrait les connaître au prochain congrès du Parti communiste, en avril, le premier depuis 13 ans. C'est là qu'on pourra mesurer l'ampleur du virage qui se dessine. Jean-Michel Leprince, Radio Canada, La Havane. Jean-Michel, juste quelques snippets à ma request. You can applaud. Uh, just to give you the flavor of, of what he was doing. And the idea is also to show what US TV doesn't do, because uh, as he can explain, there are very few, if any, American uh, broadcast networks reporting uh, in Latin America right now. They've completely abandoned the scene. So people in the United States don't see what French Canadians are seeing. About Latin America, Jean-Michel. Yeah, right. Um, I, f I feel sometimes very lonely uh, uh, down down there because I don't meet very uh, many Canadians nor Americans. I, um, I don't meet many Europe Europeans apart from Spaniards. They're about the only one left uh, who cover uh, Latin America seriously. Uh, I don't see the Germans anymore, nor the French, or the BBC is there, uh, Al Jazeera is there, fortunately, and CNN. But what CNN does, we don't see it in Canada, uh, which, is a, which is a pity. So uh, to, to give you a, a big picture of what we're going to, to a bigger picture of what we're going to talk about, uh, I cover the whole of Latin America. It's a huge territory. So we ha have to pick our stories very carefully. Uh, we don't go uh, at random in, anywhere. So we have to, to, to prepare our trips very carefully. Uh, I was just recently in, uh, in Colombia, um, and I interviewed the president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, and at the end of the interview, I asked him questions about Mexico, precisely what we are going to discuss tonight. And I told him, people in Mexico have the impression that the war that uh, uh, Calderon launched uh, against the narcos in 2006 uh, is, is, lo is being lost by the government. The violence is... Uh, uh, growing uh, uh, day by day everywhere in Mexico. And he said, uh, no, this uh, war cannot be lost. They, they have to, uh, to go on and on. There's no way Calderon can stop. Uh, he won't be president in uh, next year. There's, there go there's going to be an election, but his successor will have somehow to continue this, this war. How? Uh, nobody knows exactly. There's pressure. To, to pull the army back into the, uh, qu uh, uh, the, uh, their quarters, but uh, this, this won't happen. And, and Santos is advising Calderon, is advising the uh, president of Mexico and telling him, you've got to go on. There's no, no way this war can, can stop uh, that way. So it's, it's, a, it's bad news for Mexican, Mexicans. When I was based in Mexico until 98, uh, I, of course, I used to cover the narco stories there. And uh, one, one of uh, my favorites was uh, in Sinaloa, Culiacan, Sinaloa, with common friends that we, we, we have. Uh, but then we, we treated the story more um, on the side of uh, folklore. We, uh, we wanted to show that the whole of uh, the North American narco traffic started in Sinaloa, legally and then illegally, of course. And there was all kind of folklore going with it, the corridors, the song that uh, tell of the lives of the, uh, the narcos. So that was my, uh, my story. Uh, the, the cult to Jesus Malverde, the Robin Hood of uh, Sinaloa, the, uh, the saint of uh, the narcos uh, still nowadays. Uh, and the mausoleums that the big narcos would build for themselves when, when they die. And of course, they, they, used to, they, they tend to use them a lot. But uh, things have changed. Uh, I, I went back to Sinaloa with the same person ten, 10 years later, and the story was really dramatic. 
and uh, we, we know about Sinaloa, we know about Ciudad Juarez, we, I personally, and I think a lot of journalists tend to avoid Ciudad Juarez because we know it's dangerous, and it's not easy to tell the story uh, in Ciudad Juarez. Uh, dead people, uh, how, do you, how do you tell the, the, the story? So I, I, I chose to pick another angle. I, I chose to, uh, you've seen the pictures at the beginning of the uh, excerpts. They were shown in Morelia, Michoacan, which was one of the quietest cities in Mexico when we used to live there. Now it's one of the most violent. Just started when a new cartel, La Familia, began. Uh, and we think that those grenades were thrown by Setas, the opposite gang. Of course, they're still fighting together with, with lots of uh, uh, people dying. Uh, more recently, and this is to show and to tell how the, this uh, we call that gangrene, is spreading all across Mexico. It has not reached Mexico City yet, but I've seen it last June in Cuernavaca, an hour south of Mexico City, on the road to Acapulco. And in August, there were more dead people, no, more killings in Acapulco than in Ciudad Juarez in August. It's the, the Guerrero, the state of Guerrero with Acapulco, it's the second uh, most uh, murderous state after uh, Chihuahua, Ciudad Juarez, uh, and before Sinaloa. So it is, it is spreading, and, and there's no way to, to see or imagine how uh, uh, the uh, government of uh, Calderon can contain this, uh, uh, this uh, epidemic, this, uh, this violence spreading all, over, all, all across, all over Mexico. So this is what I'm, I've seen all these years, uh, I mean, you would, you, would, you would agree with me, uh, I'm sure. What I would add is that uh, I, we're lucky as, as foreigners, foreign correspondents, we don't stay there. Uh, we go there for a week, two weeks. Nobody knows where we go exactly, uh, for how long. We hire local people, what we call fixers, who help us a lot. Uh, and keep us safe. So we, we're not at risk uh, that, that much, I would say, almost not at risk, uh, especially in Mexico, more than elsewhere. But those guys are. And what I, I know for, I've been knowing for a while is that what they're doing and what they're seeing and living through is a story. And I'm gonna do a story with them or on them as soon as, as, I, as I can. And I think the best way for uh, all for, uh, foreign non-Mexican media is to report what's going on there and what's, what they're doing and what, trying to uh, stay alive first and do their job, which is something I admire a lot. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Uh, now, let's start down in Central America and try to follow the migration stream up to the border. One of the winners this year and I, I don't know if you're that familiar with the Cabot Prize. I probably should have explained to you that this is the oldest international prize uh, in journalism. It's administered by the school, and we select essentially the best journalists in Latin America each year. It's like the Pulitzers for Latin America. Carlos Dada is uh, Salvadoran, and uh, I met him a couple of years ago. He was up here for a conference. Carlos is a fantastic journalist. He wrote a piece that uh, should have been in the New Yorker. I don't know if you can still sell it. Though. Thank you very much. Uh, a fantastic long-form narrative investigation the, on the assassination of Archbishop Arnulfo um, uh, what's his name? Romero on the steps of his church in, before his uh, parishioners in uh, Salvador during the uh, Contra Wars in that period. And Carlos found not the trigger man, but the orchestrator of it, who was living, I don't know if I should give it away, so maybe I won't give the thing away. But it was a f fantastically beautiful story. And I have the link afterwards if anyone wants it. Carlos was uh, uh, a journalist in Mexico for a while. He went back to Salvador in 97. And in 1998, with his friend Jorge Simon, 
started something called El Faro, which means lighthouse in Spanish. It's a newspaper online, basically. And uh, it puts to shame the normal uh, traditional press in Salvador, which is not particularly distinctive. And uh, he's been recognized here. He was a Knight Fellow at Stanford in 2004. Uh, he specializes in Alfaro writing about human rights and war crimes and so on. So tell us, Carlos, about why, what the drug gangs are doing there and why these people are starting to, why, why people are fleeing up toward the United States. Thanks for your kind words, Josh. Okay. Uh, good night, everybody. Uh, people has been fleeing to the United States. Move the microphone for, uh, a little closer. For a long time. Closer. Yes. Now, is it better? Uh, people have been fleeing Central America for a long time. In the 80s, the motives were political because we had uh, civil wars. Uh, after we, uh, in the 90s, when the wars ended in Central America, and, and when we speak about migration and organized crime, I don't want to talk as a Salvadoran, but as a Central American, because it's the whole region that is going through more or less the same things, at least what we call the Northern Triangle, which is Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, where I live. But it is now the most dangerous region in the world Nowhere in the whole planet you can find a higher rate of homicides than in Honduras, El Salvador, and, uh, and Guatemala as a region. Uh, so now people are fleeing because uh, of, of the violence, because of the lack of opportunities. Uh, and if you ask me, but this is a personal comment, I would add because of the lack of hope they have lost the illusions. They have lost the energy to, to, to dream on a better country and to stay and sacrifice to do it. But then the other question we ask ourselves is, why would they make such a dangerous trip through Mexico to get to the United States? Uh, it costs around $7,000 to come here, and it, costs, and it takes around two months. If you are on the, on, let, let's call it the business class of the trip, uh, why would you spend $7,000 to get to this country when you can get deported actually before you get there? You can get killed, you can get raped, you can get, and I'm going to talk about it. Instead, for example, of going to Madrid, a Salvadoran needs not a visa to go to Europe. So uh, we have a direct flight from San Salvador to Madrid, and it will cost no more than $1,500. And you will be in Madrid eight hours after you boarded the plane, instead of two months after that, $7,000 and risking your life every day. So why would they do that? Well, the answer is networking. Because when they arrive here, their relatives are waiting for them with a shelter, with a, with a, with a roof where they can stay. Uh, they are waiting for them uh, with a job. Uh, uh, so that's why they take these risks. And because it's closer to home. So they dream of having paper someday and it will be easier to bring the kids, blah, blah, blah. The problem is that uh, the road, really, the road is hell. We came into, into the organized crime, and please stop me when I have to, to, because I can keep talking the whole night, Josh, so please let me know when it's, it's about time. Uh, we came into investigating organized crime through uh, covering immigration. The penetration of the Mexican drug cartels into Central America, now they are going up from Colombia and down from Mexico and taking Central America, is first of all due to a decision by the United States to close what is called the Caribbean route of the drugs. So now they're going through Central America. So we were fortunate enough, if, if, if I'm allowed to, say, to use such a word for these kind of subjects, we were fortunate enough to be there on proper time. We entered the, the covering of the subject because we were covering immigration. And we decided we, were not, we, will, we would not cover immigration anymore as it was used, as how many money gets into the country through remittances, how it affects the economy, how it, how it affects our culture, blah, blah, blah. We decided we have never covered 
the main road of the immigrants, which is through Mexico. What we found there three years ago is what everybody knows now because of the massacre in Tamaulipas that we already knew two years ago, which is they are kidnapping hundreds and hundreds of people every day. Right? Who is kidnapping them? Well, the drug cartels. Right? So covering immigration, we found out that the drug cartels are not drug cartels. They are, they are the cartels of the illicit. That's their business. Right? They also have business with uh, women. They, uh, full Central American women tell them they are coming to the United States to work as waitresses. And when they get to Tapachula or the south of Mexico, they end up as slaves in brothels. Uh, so we decided we, we would cover this not as daily news, but in long format, chronicles, investigative reporting, blah, blah, blah. So it, it took us a year and a half. In the end, we had a pretty good picture of the dynamics of the drug cartels, how they were uh, becoming, they, they were concentrating the monopoly of crime there. So before that, we were, able, we were just in time to witness before that, when you had these small bands of robbers, these small bands of, of rapists, well, now they all work to the Zetas. They, are, they call themselves the Zetitas. Right? We found in some shelters in southern Mexico that they were, Central American women were just in Oaxaca. They still had from Oaxaca the long road to the United States. 80 from 70 to 80 percent of women had already been raped. Right? So that's the road they take up to get to this country. So we figured out that maybe it was not enough just to publish these stories. Right? I, I mean, in El Faro, that we had to do some things that could have a much bigger projection. I, I must make you aware that El Faro is an online media, so you can imagine uh, the impact we have uh, in a country where only around 20% of the population have access to the internet. So we impact directly on decision makers, right? But especially with migration, we have this big challenge. Okay, it's great that we target the decision makers because something needs to change immediately, urgently in this road. But we also want to reach the people that are taking the road, the people that are going to become the victims tomorrow. So this was a big challenge that we solved finally making, uh, adapting the, the, the stories to radio and distributing them through community radios. But then we decided it was still not enough. So in the end we had two books uh, and a documentary. The documentary is a splendid documentary on women, on emigrating women all the way through Mexico to the United States. Because that was in the South. What was happening in the North was that uh, almost three or four years ago, uh, the, the, the human smugglers, is that the way to say it, coyote? The smugglers? Yeah. Uh, entered a fight with the drug barons in the northern, in the northern border of Mexico, the United States. That's a good place to end, because then we'll move to the Mexico. Then I'll end here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Uh, we have uh, three fantastic Mexican journalists. Uh, they work for two publications. Can you hear me? I don't know. How's this? Yeah. <coughs> There are two newspapers uh, in Mexico, uh, El Diario de Ciudad Juarez, which is on the border, right across from El Paso, and Rio Lose, which is in a city called Culiacan in Sinaloa province, which, as Jean Michel said, was. Uh, uh, has a dubious distinction. This one went. Here we go. Okay. Dubious distinction of being the birthplace of narco-terrorism in Mexico. Uh, these two papers really stand out because uh, in Mexico, basically most of the uh, uh, border journalism uh, is stenography at this point because the people engage in self-censorship as a protective device. But there are a few uh, exceptions of people who are willing to uh, stick their heads up and these are three of them here on these two newspapers. Uh, Javier Valdez Cardenas and uh, Ismael 
Burjes Perea, ¿es that correct? Did I say it right? Bujorques. Parece que dijiste burgués. Bujorques. Bujorques. Ismael Bujorques Perea. Okay. Uh, these two gentlemen started a newspaper called Rio Doce. Uh, in, uh, when, when did you start it? In uh, 1992, I guess. Yeah. So almost 20 years ago. Uh, they started the newspaper. And um, uh, the other newspaper, El Diario, is part of a chain of uh, about five or six papers along the border. And uh, I know that in the El Diario, two, at least two journalists were killed in the last couple of years. I don't know at Rio Dose what the uh, death toll is, if any. Sí, hay gente que fue matado en su periódico. No, no, yo sé que usted va a abrir el doce. No, no, no. Ok, bueno. Es un staff de cuatro personas, así que tienes que estar aquí. Así que vamos a esperar que nada pase. Así que. Ah, un bombo. Ah, un bombo. Había una granada en ahí. Sí, solo una granada. En su casa. Así que. Uh, let's start with uh, Rocio Gallegos, who has worked for 17 years covering uh, the border uh, for El Diario de Juarez. And uh, her specialties have been covering the killings of women and covering narco-traficantes. She's also uh, sort of a uh, editor, a coordinator, she calls herself, of reporters. I don't know what, I think that's like an editor. Uh, two of whom have been killed in the last couple of years, friends of hers. Uh, and this newspaper was famous because last year it ran an editorial addressed to the uh, criminals, the drug criminals, saying, uh, what do you want us to do? We'll do whatever you want us to do, just tell us what to do. It was sort of tongue in cheek because obviously what they're doing a lot, which she will describe now. So, uh, Maybe you could, Rocio, tell us a little about the uh, influence of these drug criminals uh, on your newspaper and the, uh, what they do with the migrants. Hola, buenas noches. Um, voy a contar con el apoyo de una persona para... Let me also introduce uh, Esteban Ayala. Uh, yeah, there. Uh, your, your classmate from Mexico, uh, who is going to translate what Rocio says. Okay. Um, in Ciudad Juárez, al igual que en muchos, muchas regiones del país de México, um, en los últimos años, hacer periodismo se volvió mm, muy riesgoso. Ejercer periodismo siempre trae un riesgo, pero en medio de la guerra, este riesgo se elevó. Y me refiero a una guerra entre narcotraficantes y autoridades contra narcotraficantes. Um, Juárez, like most of Mexico, in the last few years, it's been very difficult to do journalism in Mexico. Uh, doing journalism in general is dangerous but in, in times of war, it's even more dangerous. Esta situación ha hecho que en algunas regiones del país se haya optado por el silencio. Eh, algunos periodistas y algunos medios han dejado de publicar lo que ocurre. Uh, this situation has led to silence in some parts of the country. Journalists have elected to not tell the story of what is going on in Mexico. En el diario de Juárez, Hemos seguido adelante. En uh, el diario de Juárez, we have kept going on. Eso nos ha costado la vida de dos compañeros, Armando Rodríguez, asesinado en noviembre del 2008, y Luis Carlos Santiago, en septiembre del 2010. This, this has cost us the life of two of our reporters, uh, Armando Rodríguez, on November 8, 2008. 2008 and Luis Carlos Santiago in 2010. 
y um, los periodistas uh, asumimos el compromiso de seguir adelante, de no dar un paso atrás y de garantizar ese derecho de la ciudadanía a tener información y a saber qué ocurrió. Uh, we, as journalists, we keep going forward, we're not taking a step back, and we are going to guarantee the right of the people to have, to the right of the people to have information. Se han adoptado algunas medidas de seguridad para seguir haciendo este trabajo, y hemos tenido que recurrir más a la investigación en la nota diaria. We have taken some security measures to do our everyday job, and instead of doing daily news, we have, we have tried to involve, get involved in investigation duties. Eso ha sido una forma de amortiguar un poco el riesgo. That's been a way to buffer a bit the, the, risk, the everyday risks. Eh, el reto es muy grande, y los riesgos también, pero creemos que se necesita del periodismo para que siga creciendo una comunidad y el país necesitamos saber la verdad. Um, the challenge is very big, the risks are big as well, but we need journalism to keep growing as a community and as a country because we need we need to know the truth. Y, pues esta es la realidad que vivimos en Ciudad Juárez, donde los periodistas todos los días salen a la calle a informar lo que ocurre. No solamente mostramos números, mostramos los rostros de las víctimas de esa violencia. This is the reality of every day in Ciudad Juárez. Our reporters go out every day into the city. We try not to show only the numbers, but the faces of the people that are involved. Eso ha permitido conocer que no todos los que mueren están involucrados en el crimen organizado. Hay muchas víctimas inocentes y el trabajo del periodista lo ha exhibido. This has allowed everyone to know that not everyone involved in everyone killed is involved with uh, organized crime. Some are innocent victims. <coughs> y esto es lo que ocurre en una región como Ciudad Juárez, pero igual el periodista en México lo sufre en Veracruz, Michoacán, Guerrero, Coahuila, Sinaloa. ¿Cómo están aquí los compañeros? This is something that not only happens in Ciudad Juárez, but in other states such as Veracruz, Michoacán, Guerrero, Coahuila, and Sinaloa, where our friends are from. La libertad de expresión. Um, está en riesgo y la libertad de expresión le, es un derecho que le corresponde a la comunidad en general, a la sociedad y que el periodista la, la ejerce con mayor frecuencia y yo creo que el problema más grande es la impunidad que priva en el país. Uh, freedom of exp the freedom of expression is in danger. It is a right of the community and of the society, and its biggest problem is that. Impunity. And the biggest problem is impunity. It's, yeah, impunity. Gracias. Uh, thanks. Um, let's turn to uh, Javier Valdez Cárdenas and Ismael Borja. Poor man. Uh, <laughs> they, he and uh, Javier and Ismail started this newspaper themselves. In, in 92. No, no, 2003. 2003. 2003. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little about uh, working in the climate with these drug criminals and give us a sense of how 
the drug criminals are getting into the business of smuggling people and uh, maltreating them, the, uh, the people that Carlos was describing. Gracias, buenas noches. Eh, efectivamente, eh, nacimos el, 2000, el 2003 y no, no era no, nuestra intención eh, cubrir centralmente el tema del narcotráfico. Nuestro proyecto estaba más bien orientado a cubrir aspectos eh, sociales, de corrupción administrativa del gobierno en un país donde cada, cada sexenio se producen nuevas jornadas de ricos a costa de, del erario, de los recursos públicos. Sin embargo, a, a partir de 2005, con hechos que ocurrieron en, 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 Nuevo, en Nuevo Laredo, si mal no recuerdo, eh, se vino o inició una escalada de, de violencia que a la vuelta de seis años, eh, seis, siete años, pues ha convertido a México prácticamente en un infierno. Uh, we were born in 2003. It wasn't our first intention to cover drug trafficking. We were more oriented towards government corruption and uh, problems in society. Every six years in Mexico, uh, there, are new there are new rich people that, may, that become rich at the expense of others. But in 2005, in Nuevo Laredo, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, violence escalated. And during the last six years, Mexico has become some sort of hell. But, eh, además, el, cualquier periodista que se jacte de serlo en Sinaloa, en un lugar como Sinaloa, donde efectivamente tenemos la, la maldición, como una especie de maldición, que de ahí sean los originarios, los más prominentes narcotraficantes de, de este país y ahora de, de, de buena parte de América eh, Latina. Eh, no podíamos nosotros hacer periodismo sin cubrir el tema del narcotráfico, era, digamos, una obligación moral hacerlo. Eh, lo que nosotros no, no eh, veíamos... En, en, el, en, la, en, la, en el diseño del periódico, era que a la vuelta de cuatro o cinco años íbamos a estar envueltos en una guerra, que nosotros no inventamos, que nosotros no pedimos. Eh, eh, y bueno, ¿cómo lidiar? Eh, en un país como, como, como Estados Unidos, eh, el tema de la censura tal vez no sea muy, o de la autocensura no sea muy común. Pero en México, a partir de, la, de esta beligerancia, digamos, del narcotráfico y a partir de las decenas de agresiones que han sufrido los medios de comunicación y los periodistas, no solamente los periodistas a nivel personal cuando son secuestrados, golpeados, asesinados, sino medios de comunicación, estaciones de radio, televisoras, medios impresos que sufren agresiones en Sinaloa, eh, los diarios más importantes han, subido, han sufrido agresiones eh, eh, a través de, de ráfagas de AK-47, a través de granadas. Río 12 sufrió un atentado el 9 de septiembre del 2009 con granadas, etc. Entonces, ok, I'm going to try to get all this. Uh, any, uh, we, In Sinaloa, we have the curse of being, of being the state where drug trafficking was born. We know that being born here, there's, uh, we had to cover drug trafficking. It's a moral obligation. What we didn't see was that five years after we started, we would be involved in a war that we didn't start and in a war that we didn't want it. Uh, how do we deal with it? In the United States, you, you probably are not used to self-censorship, but in Mexico, it's very common starting with, uh, with drug trafficking in the last few years, uh, aggressions towards journalists have increased, not only as to journalists in particular, as journalists as individuals, but as uh, media itself. Uh, the journalists have been beaten, have been raped, have been attacked. 
uh, and the most important, the most important uh, journals in Mexico have received attacks, grenade attacks, uh, AK for attacks with AK-47. In uh, September 9th, 2009, we were victims of such an attack. Gracias. Eh, <laughs> hay un hay un gran problema en México de autocensura eh, y, y nos parece eh, a, a, una de las cosas más graves en un país donde el, el, tema, el tema del narcotráfico tiene que ser discutido y tiene que ser ex, expuesto públicamente. Y precisamente cuando al país más le urge discutir y debatir sobre el narcotráfico, los medios se están echando hacia atrás y se están metiendo en una concha. Eh, y esto eh, es una de las cosas que nos parecen más, más dramáticas. Uh, Self-censorship is a great problem in Mexico. And just right now, when we need to discuss the subject the most, when drug trafficking needs to be discussed and exposed, when it matters the most, media has cowered in a shell. People are not discussing the yo, issue. Yo os preguntaba eh, cómo, cómo hacemos nosotros para, para lidiar con este problema, ¿no? para lidiar con los, con los, con los narcotraficantes. Bueno, eh, la única forma que hemos encontrado es matizando los textos es eh, no realizando algunas investigaciones, es eh, definiendo con mucho cuidado los temas, eh, definitivamente en algunos casos no publicando algunas historias, hay temas que en relación con el narcotráfico están absolutamente vedados para nosotros, uno de ellos es el de las familias de los narcotraficantes, los narcotraficantes son muy sensibles a la información pública sobre sus familias, eh, y otro tema es el de, las, el, de las, el, de las, el de las propiedades. Y otro asunto que tiene, eh, que tiene que, o que podría representar un gran peligro para a, a un medio o un periodista es eh, revelar cosas que no se conocen públicamente sobre su estructura, su estructura criminal. How do we deal with this as journalists? We nuance, we don't do some investigations. We carefully select our issues, our subjects. Uh, there's some things we don't publish. There are subjects that are taboo. Uh, the families of the drug traffickers, we don't investigate that. We don't reveal their properties. It is also dangerous to reveal their internal structure. Hola, buenas noches. Muchas gracias por hacer posible este tipo de de actos. Nos gustaría que, que estos se realizaran en México, donde, como dice Ismael, nadie quiere discutir, revisar, analizar lo que está pasando. Eh, es un país cuya sociedad no quiere verse frente al espejo y, y revisar este asunto tan delicado de, del narcotráfico. Uh, good evening, everyone. We would like for this discussion to, to, be, to happen in Mexico, but people in Mexico don't want it to happen. People don't want to look at themselves in the mirror and see what is going on. Eh, mucha gente nos pregunta en Culiacán, Sinaloa y en otras regiones del país por qué cubrimos eh, este tema del narcotráfico, que si no hay otros asuntos de que, eh, que atender. Este, nosotros este, somos periodistas, eh, tenemos eh, la posibilidad de eh, hacernos pendejos, mirar para otro lado y, y pues, eh, hacer como que el narco no existe. Podemos investigar la agricultura o la venta de carros usados o nuevos de lujo y todos los caminos nos llevan al narco. Um, we are asked in Culiacán, why do we cover drug trafficking? Isn't there something else we can cover? We're journalists, we can look the other way, we can be pendejos. But we can look the other way, we can uh, look at car, the sales of cars, agriculture, different subjects. No nos gustaría que mañana o pasado mañana nuestros hijos, eh, sabiendo que somos periodistas, nos pregunten eh, qué estábamos haciendo nosotros, por qué no publicábamos lo que estaba pasando, por qué no hacíamos historias contando esta, esta tragedia, este infierno. Eh, ¿Por qué nos quedábamos callados? Nosotros preferimos contar, aunque sea una parte de esta tragedia nacional, a quedarnos callados, porque no somos eh, periodistas de la mordaza ni del silencio. 
y porque el silencio es complicidad y muerte y nosotros este, queremos seguir eh, escribiendo aunque sea una parcela de este infierno. Uh, we we won't we don't want our children to ask us why didn't we cover this why didn't we do this uh, where were we when it happened we're journalists we don't want to be silenced we don't want to remain quiet silence means complicity and silence means death. El narcotráfico en muchas regiones del país pero sobre todo en Sinaloa eh, ha enfermado a la sociedad desgraciadamente tenemos una sociedad eh, hipócrita que condena al narco y, y, de, y a, al mismo tiempo estira la mano para recibir sus eh, recursos. El narcotráfico es una forma de vida, no es un fenómeno policíaco y, y es una acechanza permanente para nosotros como periodistas. No se necesita una amenaza directa de eh, cualquier capo para eh, publicar o no publicar. Tenemos que aprender a, a, a saber qué suelo pisamos y en función de eso eh, seguir eh, trabajando, eh, pero es preferible esto a, a guardar silencio. Um, drug trafficking has sickened our entire country. Uh, society has been sickened by it, but society is hypocritical. They condemn drug trafficking, but they still reach out to receive the money from it. Uh, we won't be threatened. We are going to have to keep working to do this. Eh, termino diciendo que eh, en este asunto los, los malos están en todas partes. Uno como periodista tiene que cuidarse tanto del gobierno eh, porque el ejército y la policía asesinan y abusan, igual que los narcos. Eh, entonces esto dificulta todavía más el trabajo periodístico. Y por fortuna en Río 12 puedo presumir que no, no estamos infiltrados por el narco, eh, los periodistas estamos al frente de este eh, semanario y eh, tenemos que revisar eh, eh, con lupa milimétricamente cada historia antes de publicarla y hemos tenido que eh, suspender temporalmente algunos de estos eh, reportajes porque… Eh, están duras las, está muy complicada las amenazas. Muchas gracias. Uh, bad guys are everywhere. You have to look around and be careful of everyone, not just drug traffickers, but police, the government, the military, they commit abuses as well. This makes it even more difficult for us. We're proud to say at Rio Doce that we haven't been infiltrated by the drug trafficking. We are journalists at the forefront of this organization. We have to carefully analyze what we do. We have to, uh, to look at it very, very carefully. And we've had to suspend some of our stories, but we're still here. Gracias. Thank, Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Javier. <coughs> uh, that's depressing. Uh, I want to introduce, uh, but they're heroic. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty humil it's, it's humbling to hear this because here in the United States, it's so easy for us to, uh, to work. I, I want to introduce Bobby Joe Buell, who is a fantastic editor. I didn't know her until today, but uh, she asked the most magnificent questions. I wish I had an editor like her when, when I was a reporter. She's been at the uh, Arizona Daily Star for 31 years and done many different things, and now she's the editor-in-chief. Uh, she started working in Phoenix for AP, covering baseball in the legislature, which <laughs> I think there's a similarity there, but I'm, I'm struggling to, to formulate it in words. I covered the legislature, so I know that. Uh, we're recognizing the Arizona Daily Star, and their publisher, John Humanek, is over there. Uh, because they, have, uh, they are operating in an inflamed atmosphere uh, in Arizona, uh, trying to inform the people uh, about the truth about immigration from Mexico at a time that uh, politicians and uh, opportunists are, are whipping up a frenzy. Uh, I think Bobby Joe was interested to hear what the 
Mexican journalists were saying because she sees the other side of this when the people are arriving. So maybe you could give us some insights into that. Okay. Is that one? Yeah, that's good. Um, well, first I do want to say what an honor it is for my paper uh, to receive this award next to these journalists. People um, get angry with what the Arizona Daily Star publishes and they call um, or they write us a nasty letter. Um, and it is nothing uh, compared with what these journalists do every single day. This is really courage. Um, my paper is about one hour north of the border in Tucson, and so we have mostly seen our role in this story uh, as more, I'd say, would be explanatory than investigative. Um, we've always covered the border for all, all 31 years that I've been at the paper. That's always been a core beat of ours. Um, but 10 years ago, when Arizona became the number one uh, point for crossing into this country, we decided that we really needed to step up our coverage. Um, and, and try to tell the story on a much bigger scale and on a national scale. And so we started out um, sort of small by, by looking at our own side of the border, a, a very small um, trailer park community, sort of your old tin post-World War II trailers um, in a rural area south of us called Paraflaca, Skinny Dog. Um, and we uh, had a reporter move into this little trailer park. He lived there at, along with a photographer for a month. Um, and the people who lived there were farm workers. And they lived in the open, right next to a state highway. Traffic goes by. In fact, the Border Patrol um, stationed to get down to the border from a town called Wilcox. They drove right by this development every single day. And no one was ever arrested there. Um, it, it was operating in plain sight because our economy needed these people. And so the first story we ever did was a, a, a series we called Why You Need Paraflaca to try to explain to our readers um, why are these people coming here and, um, and how two-faced our own government policies are. That to a certain extent when uh, economics which drives everything, drives the need for that labor, will let them be here. Um, so that was the, the first story that we did. Since then, in the last 10 years, we've done at least one major news project every single year um, related to the issue of immigration. Everything from, um, we followed a man who came from El Salvador, Marvin Hernandez. We followed his journey um, up to Boston. Most people who come across the Arizona border don't stay in Arizona. They're headed to places like North Carolina or Boston, or poultry plants, packing plants in the Midwest. So we followed this man. Um, two years later, he, he made it to Boston, um, became a warehouse worker. Two years later, we went back um, to see how he was doing. He had married a woman in this country by that point, had a, a young child. Um, so we did that. We found a woman from Oaxaca who was living in North Carolina, um, separated from her two children, and reached a point where she realized that she would never be going back to Mexico, that her life was in this country now, and that she needed to bring her children up here, um, boys uh, 7 and 11. Um, we found them at a shelter on the other side of the border. They had been caught, um, a shelter in Nogales, Arizona, very small, or in Nogales, Sonora, very uh, small town, really, relatively speaking. Um, that shelter takes in more than 2,000 children a year caught crossing the border alone um, without their own parents. And that's what happened to these children, these two boys. Uh, she sent for them. She paid a smuggler. Everything is now organized crime. Um, 20 years ago, people could cross the border on foot um, and perhaps pay very little to somebody to bring them into this country. Now it's all organized by the cartels. It's all organized crime. Um, in some ways, people smuggling is a much lower risk, um, high profit business to be in than drug uh, dealing is. If you get caught bringing a load of marijuana into this country, you're going away to prison for a long time. If you get caught bringing in a load of people, um, you're basically going to get a few months. And it's very high profit. People now are paying $5,000 to come into this country. You, you simply cannot cross the border anymore by yourself. 
you must pay somebody to do it. If you don't, that's when you'll be raped, that's when you'll be robbed, and you probably will be anyway, even when you've paid the $5,000. Um, but, it, it, but it's all uh, very much like the mafia now. It's, it's all controlled crime. So we, did, we met these two boys. They, they had gotten caught. Uh, their smuggler had gotten caught. And they were at this shelter waiting for their mother. You can imagine how frantic this woman is in, in North Carolina. Her two sons are in this place she doesn't even know, Nogales, Sonora. Um, and the, both boys did eventually make it. The woman, I believe, had to borrow, I think it was around $8,000 more. She had to call everybody she knew um, and borrow money from them. That eventually got the two boys across. So we've tried to do those kinds of stories. Um, most recently, we did a series called Trying to Get Beyond the Rhetoric of Immigration. Um, and we looked at a lot of the things that people say, like why don't these people just come here legally? Um, and we tried to examine that issue. We did a whole series of stories on questions like that. But at the end of the day, um, it's all driven by money at this point. And um, you know, as long as there's money to be made, I, I can't see the violence or the crime ending. Well, uh, we have about a half an hour left, We're actually 20 minutes. So uh, why don't we open the uh, floor to questions and please go to the microphone and identify yourself. And uh, if we run out of questions, I'll ask a question. I have several. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, my name is John Carlos Estrada. I'm a part-time uh, student here at Columbia. I'm also uh, an associate producer at MSNBC. And uh, I'm originally from Texas. My parents are from Mexico. And so this topic is very close to me. And uh, my question is more geared towards solutions. And you know, last month in New York, President Calderón signaled a change in his tone against the war on narcos. And he sort of pushed for what many in the US thought, um, sort of legalizing marijuana here in the US. Is that something that would bring relief to the region, um, yes or no? And if not, what can we do here in the US to sort of alleviate the narco power? And, in Mexico. To, to any of you. Cualquier de ustedes, si quieren contestar. Sí, una una precisión. Calderón no habló de de legalizar. Él él dijo que que estaría dispuesto a a o que el tema debía abrirse a debate, ¿no? Pero pero no, no precisamente habló de legalizar. Me encanta la pregunta de, 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 de qué tiene o qué puede hacer Estados Unidos. Eh, se supone que Estados Unidos tiene décadas eh, apoyando a, a nuestro país para luchar contra, contra el narcotráfico. Eh, hay registros desde finales del siglo pasado, desde, perdón, mediados del siglo pasado. Eh, sin embargo, eh, ni México ni, ni los Estados Unidos juntos han podido detener el crecimiento del narcotráfico. Ahora convertido, sí, 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 ahora, ahora, ahora convertido en un fenómeno mucho, muchísimo más complejo que hace, digamos, 20 o 30 años. Um, I love the question. Uh, supposedly, we have supposedly received aid from the United States since a long, long time, since the middle of the 20th century. But neither Mexico nor the United States have been able to stop the growth of this movement. Eh, y bueno, por el contrario, yo creo que hay, hay, hay muchas cosas oscuras en la relación de México con los Estados Unidos respecto al narcotráfico. Eh, me parece que una eh, muy reciente, de mucha actualidad, es eh, la operación Rápido y Furioso. Eh, creo que no se ha dicho toda la verdad respecto a Rápido y Furioso. Y creo que no solamente los eh, eh, senadores o los representantes, los legisladores estadounidenses debieran exigir eh, más claridad al respecto sino el pueblo norteamericano. Creo que ahí no se ha dicho toda la verdad. There's a lot of dark stuff uh, in our relation between Mexico and the United States. 
The most recent example is Operation Fast and Furious. We haven't heard the truth, the entire truth in this matter. Uh, not only do legislators, it's not only legislators that need to ask uh, what is going on with this program. It's the American people that needs to ask what is going on with this. Eh, esto lo digo porque en la declaración original de, de la gente de aduanas, John Thompson, dijo que el operativo, la operación Rápido y Furioso se, se diseñó para apoyar al cártel de Sinaloa. Este aspecto eh, no, me parece que no ha sido suficientemente investigado por la prensa norteamericana. Eh, nosotros somos de la, de la teoría, de la hipótesis, de que tanto México como eh, el gobierno norteamericano está, ha diseñado una estrategia para apoyar al cártel de Sinaloa, eh, no lo sé si para combatir a los otros cárteles eh, o no sé si porque negociar o lidiar con el cártel de Sinaloa le resulta eh, más conveniente sobre todo pensando en los problemas que tiene con la frontera. Yo creo que ese aspecto tiene que eh, eh, debatirse, debatirse mucho porque entonces eh, eh, en el caso de México… En uh, el original, en Fast and Furious, en el original statement from the Customs Officer, he said that Fast and Furious was designed to help the Sinaloa cartel. This is something that has not been investigated enough by the American media. Our theory in Mexico is that both Mexico and the U.S. have a designed a strategy to support the Sinaloa cartel. Is it easier to deal with them? That's one of our theories. Sí, entonces las reglas no están claras y, y creo que en la, en la estrategia equivocada, errónea de, del presidente Calderón contra el narcotráfico y aquí quiero aclarar que no estamos en contra de la guerra contra el narcotráfico, pero sí estamos en contra de cómo se instrumentó esta guerra. No estamos en, 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 de acuerdo en, 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 cómo, en cómo se hizo, porque ya lo comentábamos al mediodía, eh, después de, de cinco años de guerra del presidente Calderón, eh, no hay un solo político importante en la cárcel y no hay una sola empresa importante asegurada por las autoridades. Um, the rules are not clear. Uh, our president has had the wrong strategy. We're not against the war, but we're against how the war has been realized. In five years of war, there's not a single politician in jail. There's not a single, um, a single business taken down by the administration. Okay, okay. Okay, Rocio and then Carlos. Buenas noches. Um, Tú preguntas qué puede hacer Estados Unidos para lidiar el narco en México, lidiar el narcotráfico en Estados Unidos y lidiar el, el consumo. Mientras haya consumo de drogas en Estados Unidos, la violencia va a existir hacia el sur y pronto va a brincar, es más, ya está brincando la frontera. Entonces, hay que, es lo que tendría que hacer Estados Unidos, lidiar el narco aquí y lidiar su consumo de drogas. Uh, you ask what can the U.S. do to um, help Mexico. You have to deal with drug trafficking over here. You have to deal with the consumption of drugs in the United States. As long as there consum there's consumption of drugs, there will be violence. And the violence is already spilling over to your country. Thank you. Carlos, did you want to say something? Yes, just briefly for the other part of your question about legalizing marijuana, will that be a relief? I think that the debate around legalizing drugs is a great debate and it's very much necessary but it addresses a health problem, not the criminal side of it. It's a business problem also. So legalizing drugs deals with the health problem. The other thing is another thing, because then you have the next questions. What do you do with the drug traffickers? Because their crime is not only trafficking drugs, actually that's the least of their crimes. They have killed thousands of people. What would you do with that? Would you, would you give them amnesty? This is what former President Fox is, is, is suggesting. Let's give them amnesty. So, because he and his side thinks this is a practical, a pragmatic way to address the problem. If you ask me, my point of view is that, just as Rocio said, but in my country we have a long story of violence and impunity. 
So if you give amnesty to somebody that has killed thousands of people, what kind of messages are you sending that a crime like killing a human being is only punished if you are not powerful enough to be in a negotiating position? That is actually the message you're sending about what the United States should do. Well, there's something I call the David Copperfield effect, which goes like this. The drugs we all know come from Colombia, right? Goes up all the way through Central America, enters Mexico, and then when it gets to the border, it, by an art of magic, disappears. <laughs> and it suddenly appears in the discotheques in Chicago, and New York boroughs, blah, blah, blah. This is a David Copperfield effect, right? So it, it is not like this, but to make it simple, it, it is like if Washington sent a message, you drug dealers, be careful because we're going to catch you from the Rio Grande to the south. If you manage to enter the United States, as long as you don't spill blood, we don't want any trouble. We want the blood of Central Americans spilled again. This is the blood that is being spilled, mine, right? And we cannot address the problem. Let me be totally honest. There is no single government in Central America that has the resources to address this problem. I mean, last week we had rain, rain, 50,000 people affected by rain. We don't have resources to attend the emergency. Forget the resources to fight the drug barrels. And this is a war, again, we didn't ask for. Right. So I, don't, I, I think that, I'm not going to say that because I'm in the United States and you're US citizens, <laughs> but I think you could do more about this. Thank That's you. all I'm going to say. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Patrick Martin Millard. I'm a, a student right now at the School of International and Public Affairs and a graduate of the journalism school. Um, I would like the panel to comment on the uh, retreat of the American made media uh, from uh, Latin America uh, in general and from Mexico in particular. Because I mean, I find it uh, quite puzzling that despite the fact, despite the growing place that uh, both the narco traffic and immigration issues occupy in the American uh, public opinion, there has only been, uh, I mean, generally speaking, superficial and sometimes very sens sensationalized coverage. Of, uh, of these issues. Uh, what do you think is missing in the American media in order to uh, uh, have good in-depth and investigative reporting that would give a better picture of the problem? I, I don't think it's any different than the reporting that you get in this country a, about most other foreign countries. I don't think there's a special you know, niche of ignorance carved out for Mexico and Latin America. Um, there's, in most newspapers in this country, there's less coverage of world affairs than, than I've ever seen in my adult life. So, um, you know, I, I think that's not good, but I don't think that there is a special exception that there's less interest or less coverage. I think there's just less coverage of world affairs, period, in American newspapers. Is that true in Canada? Yeah, it's uh, the same in Canada. Less, less coverage. On, only, I would say, us, uh, public uh, television, radio, are doing some, some effort. But you know, it's a problem of uh, uh, resources, money, budgets. Uh, it's hard. And I would say Latin America is, on the, la is, is the last on the, li on the list. Uh, uh, you've got uh, the Middle East now, crisis everywhere. You had the earthquake in Haiti. I mean, no West West priority for, for everybody. Lots of money is going into that. And Latin America, Latin America gets for, forgotten, um, and I, I, I don't. I, there's a bit of uh, laziness on parts of uh, managers, uh, media managers, bosses. Uh, uh, it looks like uh, pack journalism a lot. Everybody at the same spot. We're doing all the same thing. Uh, they're not trying enough to look for different stories, and I don't understand why. Really, uh, that's what the public wants different stories that that's where they, they, they that's why they, they would want to, to watch you and not the others I'm, I'm okay. really I'm at a loss answer. with that oh you're I'm a different, different person, person. Oh. <laughs> yes sir oh, uh, Bill Harris I'm an alum of Columbia you know I'm surprised uh, Mr. LaPence since you said you cover all Latin America that you're not more sanguine that the violence and terrorism in Mexico can be controlled we have this example in Colombia where they've been successful. They're controlling the violence there now. I don't know if it's going to last, but I mean, they really do have it, and things are really looking up there. So I think a government you know, can control this. 
uh, you know, there's, so maybe we should look to Colombia as a model on how they've done it and you know, adapt some of those principles to Mexico. Yeah, I think, I, think the, the, I hope that Calderon is looking at Colombia for a, uh, you know, a solutions to, to that. Uh, apparently, they're using the same uh, tactics, the army. I mean, how well are they using the army? I'm not sure. Some would say now, I mean, there's a big movement in Mexico with uh, Javier Sicilia, notably against the use of the army, the way it's being used by Calderon. Uh, the police uh, in Colombia is up to the task, has been up to the task for a, a good while. It's not in Mexico still. Then we can ask Cal Calderon after six years, how come the federal police, which, which is apparently the less corrupt, the, 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 the best paid, for police force in Mexico, why is it not bigger? Why state police have not been cleaned yet? Uh, because they are the most corrupt, and even Calderon said it publicly several times. I mean, the police is corrupt, the judges are corrupt. There's a, I know there's a, a reform uh, on the way of the judicial system in Mexico. Why, why it has been six years? I mean, why isn't, is it, isn't it done yet? Colombia so, has all those problems. Exactly. And they overcome them. Uh, exactly. Colombia has, has done it in, in a way, but it was, I think, less complicated as, as, as far as the uh, drug cartels, are, cartels are, are concerned. They had a couple of cartels. They had Cali, they had Medellin, then, uh, but they are, they are still there. It's different. They are more underground now and doing their business you know, quietly. It's different. But uh, they had the same kind of war but on a, a much smaller scale in Colombia than now in Mexico. Now in Mexico, it's out of control, it's huge. In Colombia, on the other hand, they have the guerrilla, which is not over yet. So it's, uh, the situations are not exactly the, are not exactly the same, but uh, you know, how come in six years, they have not done more in Mexico? I, I don't know, I don't know. We have to move on because we're running out of time. Are you satisfied with the answer? Thank you. I, uh, yeah. Hi there. Um, my father's Colombian. Um, he actually grew up on the Caribbean coast. So, would you speak up? Oh, sorry. Uh, my father's Colombian, and he grew up on the Caribbean coast, which was used to be the principal exit route for uh, cocaine to um, north. And I was just curious, kind of following on from that question, um, the Mexicans were traditionally used as middlemen once the product got to America. I was wondering how how it has changed from the Mexican point of view, because the product is still coming from Colombia. What, what has happened to the Colombian presence in Mexico? How have they, uh, like you say, they've become more low key, but what have they, what presence still exists for them to even receive the product in the first place? The Mexicans took over everything. Uh, they're even in Colombia now. They, they control the routes uh, to everywhere. Uh, Europe, Africa, North America, uh, and, and they are doing it from Colombia, Bolivia, and, and, uh, and uh, Peru through Brazil. Uh, the Mexicans are everywhere, the cartels. And the Colombians, not so much. They're more local than before, I think. Is that OK? See, it. Uh, did you want to say something, Ismael? Quiso. Sobre lo que, sí. sí, mira, lo, los, eh, los propios colombianos han reconocido desde hace ya un par de años o tres años que los, que los mexicanos están quedando con, con gran parte del negocio. Eh, prácticamente los colombianos se están dedicando ahora solamente a producir la cocaína y los mexicanos se están encargando ahora ya desde el propio Colombia, a trasladarla por diversas rutas, no solamente el Pacífico, también por el Caribe, Venezuela es una gran plataforma ahora de tráfico de cocaína que, que llega eh, de Colombia y se va a África y de África se va a España y de España se distribuye por toda Europa. Eh, bueno, el, el gran problema aquí es que la... La, el, el crimen se está eh, eh, el, el crimen organizado eh, voy a usar una, una, una eh, figura de, de, de McLuhan eh, el crimen organizado ha convertido al planeta en una, en una gran aldea 
también, porque ahora está en todas partes al mismo tiempo. De hecho, lo que me parece más terrorífico en, en los últimos años es la relación que se está estableciendo entre los narcotraficantes mexicanos, colombianos, con los europeos. Ya se están empezando a establecer algunas relaciones, hubo hace poco un operativo en los Estados Unidos donde desmantelaron una red de, este, de los Zetas que tenían relación con la drangueta y se sabe, bueno, que, que esta mafia que opera en el sur de Italia es una mafia que está prácticamente desplazando a la Cosa Nostra, etcétera, etcétera. Entonces, eh, nos estamos enfrentando a, ya no a los narcos colombianos, ya no a los narcos mexicanos, sino a, una, a un crimen, digamos, mucho más global. Um, Colombians have recognized recently that Mexico is taking over everything. They just produce cocaine, but Mexicans distribute it everywhere. They're the ones that ship in many routes, not just the coast of Colombia, but through Venezuela, through Africa, through Spain. That's how it gets to Europe. The big problem is organized crime. I'm going to use a figure from McLuhan. He said that the planet is a global village. This is what hap is what happening with organized crime. They're becoming a global village. Crime is everywhere. And uh, there's relationships are starting to build between Mexican, Colombian, and even Italian cartels. Uh, the United States have recently uncovered Has, um, has arrested Zetas that were related to the southern, uh, with the Andragheta, which is the southern Italian mafia. So it's global crime now. That's incredible. Girl, yeah, quickly. Just quickly. briefly addressing both, because uh, 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 you said that Colombia had all this and it overcame the problem. Uh, I, I think I understood that you said that Colombia had all the problems Mexico is facing now, but Colombia overcame. Yeah, I mean, they have surprised Well, uh, well let, me, let me really, really put, a, cast a big doubt on the famous Colombia successful story, because it's not such a thing. It took billions of U.S. tax dollars, billions of U.S. tax dollars, just to pop the ball, and it popped up in Mexico. So where's the success story? I mean, is that a Colombian success story? Tell me how they did it so we do it in Mexico. Then where will it, will it pop up? It's popping up in Central America now. And it's the same people. They just moved. There's something that, that uh, security and organized crime analysts call the cockroach effect. Okay? If you flee a house, they will move to the next house. This is exactly what's going on. Since they killed Pablo Escobar, you know, because this affects the whole life of everybody, then something really, really curious began to happen in the northern of Mexico. You began to hear cumbias in the north of Mexico. <laughs> Cumbia is not a northern Mexican music. Mariachis in Mariachis in Colombia. Mariachis in Colombia. So this is what, what started to happen. So tell me, where's a successful Colombian story? Okay, great. We have time for one last question. This is very interesting. I'm sorry, but we are running out of time. Yes. Yes, I wanted to ask about how you, we've been talking a lot about how we cannot control organized crime. It's growing just like the free market, just like free trade and NAFTA. They're networking, um, and there's this sort of um, this kind of. Uh, Well, it's a dark situation, a very dark situation, and the pessimism with that goes hand in hand. But I am wondering if there is a, in, if there are people in Mexico naming some of the initiatives like Plan Merida, or some of these initiatives that have been possibly implicated in this problem by. Um, Just to, I mean, there's been a lot of unverified things, uh, facts, unverified information going around about how maybe um, some of the money is not being allocated correctly from Plan Merida and subsidizing police forces that may be committing other abuses, um, that they're supposed to be fighting against drug traffickers, but um, are suppressing strikers, miners in, in the north and Chihuahua. Um, if you could maybe elaborate on that and maybe verify some of these, um, this information. So in other words, what is the success of this Merida program and is the money being used in corrupt ways? Is that correct? Uh, is that what you asked? Yes, yes. Okay. 
Is anyone familiar with the way the Merida money is being spent in the United States, in Mexico? Yo creo que los efectos del Plan Mérida todavía no se pueden medir en México, pese a que vivimos ya varios años eh, un combate al crimen organizado con recursos que Estados Unidos está entregando a través de este plan. Eh, algo que también falta mucho es la transparencia. Hay mucha opacidad en relación al manejo de esos recursos y la canalización que tienen. Uh, uh, the effects of the Merida plan cannot be, can still not be measured even though we have received money from the United States for many years. The main problem is transparency. We need to know what these resources are being used for. Sí, muy, muy breve. Eh, el, el, la iniciativa Mérida eh, no es importante para México, es importante para los Estados Unidos. Eh, los recursos que, que, que le da México a los Estados Unidos a través de la iniciativa representan el punto 2%, punto 3 por ciento del presupuesto que México destina al, al asunto de la seguridad. Sí, entonces… En términos monetarios, en términos de dinero, no es significativo. Sin embargo, la iniciativa Mérida le ha servido a los Estados Unidos para eh, eh, meterse, digamos, o meter más todavía la bota en nuestro país. Ahorita hay un edificio de 17 pisos en reforma que alberga a decenas y decenas de espías norteamericanos que están en la Ciudad de México y se desplazan a Culiacán, de repente detienen a un empresario lo paran con este pasamontañas. Okay. Um, uh, plan Mer the Merida Initiative is not important for Mexico. It's important for the United States. The resources allocated by the Merida Plan only make up 0.3% of our national security budget. It's not uh, important in terms of money. It's important for America to get their boots in Mexico even more. Right now there is a building in Mexico City, a 17 floor building that is filled with American spies. They travel to the north and with hoods they kidnap people and they take them in. Sí, para finalizar creo que, que este tipo de iniciativas eh, permiten eh, eh, sobre todo a los Estados Unidos desarrollar sus políticas, digamos, eh, eh, de intervención, expansionistas eh, de una manera velada en países lo hicieron en Colombia y recuerden que un poquito antes de que se fuera Uribe ya querían instalar por ahí una base militar. Y este, por lo pronto hoy el New York Times publicó que los Estados Unidos tienen años este, trabajando con agentes encubiertos en México y, y México, dicen ellos, ni siquiera uh, está enterado. Um. This type of initiative only allows uh, America to develop its interventionist policy. You have to remember that Colombia, shortly before Uribe left, uh, the United States was already planning to set up a military base. Uh, the New York Times today published an article saying that the Americans have infiltrated Mexico for many years and uh, the Mexican government had no clue about this. Hace, perdón, último, último. <laughs> Hace... Eh, dos meses, meses. Río se publicó una nota de eh, un, un grupo de policías norteamericanos encapuchados en la ciudad de Culiacán, en una zona residencial, detuvo a un empresario, lo paró, el empresario, eh, me parece, iba solo, lo detuvo, lo bajó, lo interrogó, sacó una laptop, le dijo, pon la mano aquí, y puso la mano ahí, aparecieron todas las los ingresos que el empresario había tenido a los Estados Unidos, etcétera, etcétera. Eran policías gringos con capucha. Um, let me just finish by saying that two months ago, Rio Doce published a story in which a group of undercover policemen in Culiacán detained a businessman, a uh, hooded policeman. They took him into a car, uh, they interrogated him, they uh, took out a laptop, made him put his hand in the laptop, and uh, the information about his entire business came up after he put the hand in the laptop. Wow. So, uh, I hope this has piqued your interest. I think the opportunities uh, for young journalists. Are we closing this? 
I'm about to close it. Yeah, why? Did you want to say something? Can I have some last words? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Josh. That's no, no, okay, it just, of course. It's, it's just really, it keeps my attention that organized crime has entered so much of our lives, of everybody, right? That look at just what happened tonight here. We are in a room full of journalism students, of journalists to be, right? Who come to see a panel of people who, have, who will be awarded tomorrow a very big award on excellence in journalism, and we have not spoken about journalism here. <laughs> this just kept my attention, Josh, I needed to say this. Do you want to say something about journalism? Well, I think that the big question that was not asked tonight is, right. are we doing the proper job? Are we doing it properly? Are we answering the needs of our societies through journalism? That is a big question. But it would take another panel to, it would. to talk well, about this. Tomorrow night, well, not the, uh, I was going to say that this, I think, was just an appetizer, really. I, if I were a young student sitting where you are, I would think to myself, as soon as I get out of this school, I'm going to cover this story. This is an amazing story. And, you know, I used to work for a guy named Gene Roberts who said, when they zig, you zag. I mean, do not go do the story that everybody else does. You do the story that Jean-Michel is doing, or Bobby, or the rest of the people, Carlos. I mean, this is, uh, you've really been treated to a tremendous insight here. And uh, I encourage you to, uh, to think seriously about figuring out how to cover this story, and also to discuss in your classes just what Carlos asked. Why is, not, why is this story not being covered? This is a neighboring country to the United States. And uh, they're having more problems with their civil society than a place like Afghanistan. I mean, they, their civil society is collapsing because of our appetite for drugs. Why don't we cover that? That's just an amazing challenge, I think. So I'm sorry we run out of time. This has been a very inspirational uh, discussion. I want to thank Lisa Red for putting this together. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, winners.